So we saw in the last video that uh, by solving the eigenvalue problem for a matrix like A, B, C, D, not necessarily diagonal to begin with, you can uh, come up with a basis, the eigenbasis, uh, which provides you with a diagonal matrix, uh, which is a different matrix, but that represents the same underlying linear transformation as your original matrix. And uh, one way to describe what's happening on the differential equation system side of things is to say we have basically the same differential equations, um, but with uh, different variables. A change of variables relates how to go between the x, y's, the x and y, and the u and w. All right. Now I want to use this fact uh, that we we can uh, use the eigenbasis for for a matrix to come up with a another matrix that represents the same underlying linear transformation. Um, and here's something that we're going to need to know in order to use it. Uh, so general linear algebra fact, and this is something that you would study in uh, po possibly you studied it in Math 4a, or you might study it, study it in a later linear algebra class if you take one. Uh, if you have two matrices, A and B, and they are both representations of the same underlying linear transformation, then, so for example, like these two matrices here, uh, then they have the same determinant. So in other words, uh, what we say is the determinant is uh, an invariant of the underlying, uh, and it's an invariant of the matrix. It doesn't matter what basis you use to represent a linear transformation, regardless of which basis you use to create a matrix, uh, either it's A or B, you get the same determinant. So uh, this is sort of the the technical way to say what I'm saying here, the deter determinant is an invariant of linear transformations. Uh, it doesn't change, the determinant doesn't change when you change which matrix you're using to represent your linear transformation, whether it's A or B. Uh, so really when you talk about the determinant of a matrix, it's really the determinant of the linear transformation uh, underneath. And the matrix is just one, uh, the particular matrix you use to compute the determinant will be one way of looking at the linear transformation using one basis. Um, so again, here in this example, whatever matrix you started with, once you solve the eigenvalue problem for that matrix, um, you get a diagonal matrix such that both of them are both pretty much the same linear transformation. You just have to do a change of variables, like x, y to u, w, um, in order to see how it's really the same linear transformation. So this is, uh, this is really useful, and it will already help us over here to figure out something. Um, so let's think about the determinant of A. So let's say A is A, B, C, D, and let's say you have solved the eigenvalue problem for A, and then what would you get when you solve the eigenvalue problem for A is a different matrix, but that represents the same underlying linear transformation. It'll have lambda 1 and lambda 2 down the diagonal, and zeros off the diagonal, right? Now, the determinant of A will be, well, AD minus BC, right? That's one way of thinking about it, but it will also equal, according to the principle I'm describing here, since the determinant is invariant of how you actually represent it, that linear transformation, the determinant of A will also equal lambda 1 times lambda 2 minus 0 times 0, right? The determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix. So the determinant of A is actually the product of the eigenvalues. That is cool. So you can just look at a matrix and you can immediately know what's the product of the eigenvalues before you know what the eigenvalues are. So I can give you any matrix. Uh, I don't know, I could just make up a random matrix. One, two, three, four. Okay, what, what's the product of the eigenvalues? Answer, it's the determinant. Four, one times four, minus two times three, uh, is negative 2. So negative 2 is the product of the eigenvalues for this matrix. I know that without actually finding the eigenvalues. That's very cool. And that tells me something, actually. Uh, it does tell me some information. Uh, it's negative. So it, for this matrix, 
if the product of the eigenvalues is negative, then the eigenvalues must have opposite sign, right? They can't both be positive, and they can't both be negative. Otherwise, the determinant, the product of the eigenvalues, would be positive. So the eigenvalues must have opposite sign, and I can learn that without actually looking at what the eigenvalues are. So this is very cool. Uh, if you find that the determinant of your matrix is negative, then that means you must be in this case, no, oh, sorry, this case where they have opposite sign. Well, okay, but that's if the eigenvalues are real. We actually don't know whether the eigenvalues are real or not, right? Just from looking at the determinant. I don't think you can know that. So let's, let's at least uh, claim this one victory here, which is if, if you manage to figure out that you're on this branch somehow, then by checking the determinant, then you would know that you're here. By che checking the determinant, you would know that you're looking at a, a, at a saddle point. And if the determinant is, is positive, then you know that you're either there or there. So how about, okay, I've sort of moved things around. Uh, I swapped the order of these so I can do this and say, Okay, so first you either take this branch and then go to either stable node or unstable node, or you take the saddle point branch. And to take the saddle point branch, you'll know that that's, you know, you know that if you know you're here, then you know you're taking the saddle point branch if the determinant is less than zero. And you know that you're at least one of these, but you don't know which one necessarily if the determinant is greater than zero. Uh, and that brings to mind, oh, well, what if the determinant actually equals zero? Uh, well, the determinant equals, I actually forgot to include that. That, that has a totally different picture to it. Uh, determinant equals zero when one of your eigenvalues is actually zero. Um, so I would say that's a real eigenvalues, that's an, an, an example of a real eigenvalues case. So maybe I'll make that come out here. The determinant equals zero, then I think I gave you one homework problem where that, that actually happens. So uh, you still have like two eigen eigenvectors. Um, let's say one of your eigenvectors is not zero. If both eigenvectors, oh, sorry, sorry, eigenvectors cannot be zero. Uh, let's suppose that uh, one eigenvalue is zero and the other isn't. So this, we're still in that case here. So Sorry, I'm confusing myself a little bit. So, uh, in the determinant equals zero case, it must be that the product of the eigenvalues was zero, meaning at least one of them was zero, but not both of them are zero because we're assuming they're distinct. So, this is a situation where one eigenvalue is zero and the other isn't. Now your eigenvectors are gonna point in some directions. So let's say, you know, one eigenvector points this way and one eigenvector points that way say these are your eigenvectors, um, then well actually I'm just realizing that this one even splits into two cases. Uh, this one splits into, you know, you could have, so overall here we have maybe lambda 1 equals 0 and then depending on whether lambda 2 is positive or lambda 2 is negative we'll get different pictures. So let me not dwell too much on this extra special case, um, but just leave some pictures. So I'm going to put a yellow line uh, to go along the direction of the uh, eigenvector that, that goes with the eigenvalue 0, um, and that will be a whole line of equilibria. That's the situation we end up in, right? Um, the eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue 0 is the, the one that's in the null space of A, which in this case A has a non-trivial null space, and every point on there is actually an equilibrium. And then the other eigenvector, the one corresponding to lambda 2, the one that's not 0, the, the eigenvalue that's not 0, that eigenvector dictates the direction uh, in which trajectories travel, whether they, whether they go towards or away from the line of equilibria. Uh, so 
uh, sorry, it, it, it dictates the direction in which they travel, and then the sign of that eigenvalue, whether it's positive or negative, tells you whether they go away, like maybe like this, or towards the line of equilibria. Okay, so that's kind of a, a weird case that I forgot to include. Okay, but anyway, um, what about uh, when you're in the complex eigenvalue situation? Does the determinant tell you anything? So let's think about this. So let me go back here, and let's say I have a matrix with complex uh, eigenvalues. Then, so let's say alpha plus minus i beta are the eigenvalues. Then the diagonal formal that, of that matrix will be like this, alpha plus i beta, alpha minus i beta, right? And then the determinant of that is the product of the eigenvalues. That'll be alpha plus i beta times alpha minus i beta. And that's, if you multiply that out, you get alpha squared plus beta squared. You get this real number. And it's actually always positive. So um, in this branch, the determinant being positive or negative doesn't tell you anything because it's always positive. Um, so if you're in this branch, then you know that the determinant is definitely positive. Um, I guess that's helpful in some way because that means if the determinant is negative, then you know you must be along this branch. So you must be here at saddle point. Okay, so to summarize how the determinant, what the determinant tells you, if the determinant is negative, then you're here at saddle point. If the determinant is positive, you could be here somewhere, or you could be here at one of these two. Now, it would be nice if we had a way of distinguishing between these two, which was similarly easy, um, or a way of distinguishing between these different possibilities. Enter the trace. So you have seen that determinant is an invariant of linear transformations. Well, there's another invariant that's less talked about, but is also very uh, neat and important, and it's called the trace. The trace of a matrix. So you know the determinant of a 2 by 2, it's AD minus BC. And then for bigger matrices, it's more complicated. Uh, the trace is the sum of the things along the diagonal. Just A plus D. That's it. Believe it or not, that is actually invariant uh, under a change of basis. It's an invariant of linear transformations. So uh, the same fact here written about determinants holds for trace. Interesting. So if I, uh, if I write something in its diagonal form, where the eigenvalues are along the diagonal, so if I write rewrite my original matrix in its diagonal form, then what we're saying here is that the trace of this, so the sum a plus d, equals the trace of this, lambda 1 plus lambda 2. Ah, so that's, that's neat. So just like when I write down a random matrix, like 1, 2, 3, 4, I can take the determinant and I can tell you the product of the eigenvalues without solving the eigenvalue problem. Similarly, I can tell you the sum of the eigenvalues. I can tell you that for this matrix, 5, is the sum of the eigenvalues. That's pretty cool, right? Just take a matrix, instantly you know the sum of the eigenvalues without, uh, without writing down any polynomials. It's just 1 plus 4, just add things down the diagonal. Um, and one thing I like about this one is that uh, you know, the trace is easy to, equally easy to calculate, pretty much, no matter how large the matrix is. So if it's a 10 by 10 matrix, the trace is still the sum down the diagonal. But, you know, a 10 by 10 determinant is a pretty insane thing to try to calculate. All right, so how does that help us? Well, uh, let's say uh, you know you have real eigenvalues distinct, and let's say you know the determinant is positive, and so you're now wondering, was the product of the eigenvalues positive because both eigenvalues were positive, or was the product positive because both eigenvalues were, were negative? Okay, I think I pointed to the wrong areas. Was it because they're both negative or because they're both positive? Um, well, check the trace. The trace is the sum of the eigenvalues. If the eigenvalues are both negative, then their sum is negative. And 
if the eigenvalues are both positive, then their sum is positive. So this is the trace A negative branch, and this is the trace A positive branch. And then over here, um, the trace is also quite useful. So uh, let's say uh, your matrix has this diagonal form, which has to be written with complex numbers. Then the trace of the matrix, the sum down the diagonal, equals the trace of the matrix written in this form, since the trace is an invariant. And what is the sum? It's 2 alpha. The, the i betas cancel, right? This, it's 2 alpha. So the trace tells you about 2 alpha, meaning, uh, which, uh, which implies that if the trace is positive, then alpha must be positive. If the trace is negative, alpha must be negative. And if the trace is 0, alpha must be 0. Right? So that immediately lets you distinguish between these different situations. Very nice. Now, I guess what I'd say is the, the only missing bit uh, where you need to make a decision in this diagram, uh, and there's no uh, green text telling you what, what to, how to make the decision, uh, is up here. Uh, how do you decide in the first place whether you're down here or down here? So, yeah, if the determinant is negative, then you know you're down here because you, this is the only determinant negative branch, sub-branch, right? Is, is the saddle point. Um, but if the determinant is positive, then how do you know if you're over here or if you're, or if you're uh, over here, real or complex? Well, uh, unfortunately, that's the only place where uh, it is a little bit more complicated than just staring at the determinant and trace alone. Um, although there is a way to do it that just, uh, you know, has you look at a, a certain combination uh, of the determinant and trace, and I'll, I'll let you look at that in the textbook. But what I would recommend is just make it easier just to keep things simple. Um, it's no more complicated to just start solving the eigenvalue problem and then see which branch you end up in and then stop your solution of the eigenvalue problem as, as, as soon as you know which branch you're in, um, real or complex. So, you know, just yeah, to figure this out, you have to write down the characteristic polynomial and then look at whether the roots are going to be real or complex. But then you don't need to worry about exactly what the roots are. You can stop computing from there and just focus on the determinant or trace to figure out which sub-branch inside here you're in. All right, so in the next video, I want to uh, do an example, and hopefully that will help uh, bring things together for you.